Good evening. It is so good to be with you, and I've enjoyed the time. Thank you to the committee for the invitation. Thank you, Canadians, for your welcome. You're my neighbor, so we got to be good neighbors. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. I thank Brother Randy for his messages on the soul. And I was wondering how those messages were all going to work together, but I think I figured it out by the time Randy finished. I would say it this way, God's promises are good for your soul. <laughs> so you just keep that in mind, a great summary of what we've heard today. So we've been hearing about God's promises. We've really had three ideas. One is God's promises are forever. And then God's promises give us confidence in Him. And then finally today, God's promises are reliable. Is there anything really else you need? <laughs> this is wonderful. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is where it really all comes together in the New Testament about really knowing where the promises come from and how they are reliable. Many years ago, a man came from England to Minnesota, and he needed to cross the Mississippi River. It was early in winter, and he had never been in such a cold place in all of his life. <laughs> and he needed to meet somebody on the other side of the river. The river only freezes very, very rarely, but when it's very cold, it does. But he didn't say, see a bridge that was easy for him to cross the Mississippi. Of course, the river was frozen that time and coated with ice. He didn't know how thick it was. And so he was afraid to step out onto that ice and walk across the frozen river. He finally got up enough courage and went down to the river bank. But he was so scared, he got down on all fours and he crawled across on his hands and knees. He was wanting to spread out his weight in case the ice would crack. Every sound he heard frightened him because he thought the river was going to break in two. If you haven't been on a frozen lake or river where you hear the, rice, the ice crack, it is, it is quite frightening. But just as he was about to make it to the other side, he heard someone singing behind him. And he turned around to see someone in a sleigh being pulled by a horse just gliding across the ice. You know, that's a good illustration of the two ways that Christians can live their lives. There are some Christians who read the promises of God and they want to trust Him, but they go so slowly because they're afraid at any moment maybe God will break that promise to them and they'll plunge into the river. And so they live their lives with worry and fear, even though they know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. But then there's other Christians who discover that the promises of God are solid and trustworthy, like that frozen ice. And they step out and they trust the living Word of God, and their life becomes filled with singing and joy and praise to God. But you know what's interesting? Both of them share the identical same promises. What's the difference? It's just their attitude toward them. And one of the great truths of Scripture is that our God is a faithful God. He's absolutely dependable and reliable in all that He says and all that He does. You don't need to turn there, but I just wanted to make sure we read this passage in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1.3, Peter says, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Then verse 4, he says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. He has given us all things. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. <laughs> Do you listen to how we pray, though? This is how I pray oftentimes. Lord, give me strength. <laughs> Lord, be with us. Lord, bless us. But we've already been given all things. 
We have all spiritual blessings in Christ. We've been giving exceedingly great and precious promises. So perhaps it might be better if we just say, Lord, thank you for what you've given to us. Help us to lay hold of what is ours. And that's why we've been looking at these messages, because the promises are for us. Look at the second verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, just by way of introduction. Paul gives what we might call a standard greeting. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we go right past that verse because it's just an introduction, just sort of like saying hello. (laughs) But as I was looking at that, in the light of what we've been thinking about, I think Paul is praying a promise for the believers. Because can Paul give someone grace? Can Paul give someone true peace? It says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read earlier that grace has come by Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. So he's praying that these truths would be realized in the Christians. It's interesting in our story here that Paul goes on and he's speaking something about a challenge that he's facing. We're going to read at verse 15, and we're kind of jumping right into the middle of his statement, but just read with me these verses in verse 15. Here's what he writes to the Christians. He said, And in this confidence I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are men to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Years ago during the Victorian age, there was a poet, her name was Christina Rossetti, and she wrote a poem about promises, and the title is, Promises Are Like Pie Crust, They're Made to Be Broken. That is a perfect summary of what the world thinks of promises. A pie crust is meant to break. (laughs) And by what we've seen in our lives, oftentimes our promises are broken. But let's think about the situation in this story. Paul had made a promise about his plans to travel to Corinth. And when he didn't come, some of those in the gathering made some assumptions about Paul. And they were saying, see, you can't trust what he says. And even though many did trust Paul, there were some, and maybe they were just visitors, maybe they were false teachers, but either way, they doubted what he said. So let's think about what we just read about Paul. He's in Ephesus, and he wants to go visit the Corinthians in the church in Corinth. And so his plan, he says, is I'm on my way to Macedonia. But first I'm going to come to Corinth, then I'm going to go up to Macedonia, and I'll come down again to Corinth to visit you a second time, and then I will go back to Judea. But Paul's plans changed. And instead of going to Corinth first, he went straight up to Macedonia without ever making it to Corinth. And then we read, he says this, I didn't do this without careful consideration. Do I just change my plans on a whim? 
Am I just someone who says, yes, I'm coming one minute, and the next minute I say I've changed my mind? Am I that unpredictable? And so that's what this chapter is about. And again, I like to give a simple outline, and it's going to be in three parts. The first one is an accusation. And some are going to say, Paul is unreliable. But then secondly, there's going to be a defense. And Paul's going to say, I am reliable. But the, the third one is a promise, and that is God is reliable. So the first part, this accusation, Paul is unreliable. Now, why were they going to say this? If you just glance across the page at the, the end of 1 Corinthians, here's what he says in verse 5. He said, Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. He tells him he's going to go to Macedonia. He might even spend a good amount of time there, a few months with them. But now in his second letter we just read, in verse 15, and in this confidence I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. I wanted to bless you twice by coming to you guys two times. But then, in actuality, he never comes at all. And so that's what brought the accusation. Paul doesn't keep his promises. So do you see his chains of plan? In chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, he says, I will come visit you. Now in 2 Corinthians, he says, I am actually going to visit you two times. But then, he never comes at all. Therefore, Paul is unreliable, is what they're thinking. He changes all the time. You can't trust what he says. Has someone ever promised that they're going to come visit you, and you make arrangements, and then they never show up? That's frustrating, isn't it? And so their conclusion was this. Paul broke a promise. And here's what they're saying. If you can't trust his plans... How can you trust his teaching? He is unreliable. They were doubting Paul, even his teaching of the Word of God. So that was the accusation. But now Paul comes back with this defense that he is reliable. And to do that, he's going to do two things. The first thing he's going to do is defend his own character. He's going to talk about himself. That's an interesting thing when you read the letters of Paul. He's often talking about himself, about why he is God's messenger, or here's why I did this. And it's not because Paul was so concerned about himself. He was concerned about his ministry, because his ministry was to give God's message to the people, this wonderful new teaching. And so he wanted to make sure they understood that he was bringing God's message in a reliable way. But that's not all he does. Secondly, he also shows the character of God. And that's the real important teaching in this chapter. Is God reliable? What is he like? Can we trust him? So we have this interesting comparison between the promises of God which are reliable and the promises of men are which like pie crust. They break very easily. So here's what he said. We didn't read this verse back in verse 12, but he said this. He says, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. He's saying, we didn't live by the flesh. Now, what does he mean by that? By just who we are in ourselves, our old nature, who we are just before we are saved. Of course, we still have the flesh today. And he's saying, I didn't come to you with fleshly wisdom. Now, when Paul taught about the flesh, he also talked about something else on the other extreme. What was that? The spirit. I wasn't led by the flesh in making this decision. I was actually led by the Spirit. He says, by the grace of God. 
He lived by the Holy Spirit. He didn't live by the law. He lived by the grace of God that was shown to him at the cross. And then he says something similar in verse 17 that we did read. He says, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Was I just fickle and changing my mind, he's saying. Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. He says, I am reliable because I am led by the Spirit. If I was led by the flesh, I could never be reliable. He says, when I plan something, it's not just me making a decision in my flesh, saying yes, and then, oh, you know what? No, I'm not coming. Paul would not do that, he's saying. But he never makes it to Corinth. Now, why didn't Paul make it to Corinth? He tells us at the end of the chapter in verse 23. Notice what he says. He says, moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. He's saying, God is my witness. I am telling the truth. The reason I didn't come was so I could spare you grief. Why did he have to spare them? Because if he had come to Corinth at that time, he would have to rebuke the Christians. Because do you remember what they did in the first book of Corinthians? They allowed sin in their midst, some very serious sin, and they were just brushing it aside. And if he had to come visit them at that time, it would have been a very harsh meeting. And he knows he needs to let the Holy Spirit and God work on them to get them to realize what they've done. So he says, I had to spare you that. And so Paul needed to defend his character to show that he was someone you could count on, that he was a faithful apostle. But he moves on to what's more important, and he wants to show us that God is reliable. And you can trust what he says. And so he says this in verse 18. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Because of the faithfulness of God, I'm coming to you as his messenger. And I'm not going to bring you an unclear message. I'm not going to say two different things. I'm not going to say yes, but oh, I changed my mind. It's no. You see, if God calls someone to be an apostle, they've been called to be sent to send God's word to the people. They're a messenger from God. So he's not going to waver between two different ideas. Remember Paul said to Timothy, commit these things to faithful men. That's who will bring the word of God. And so he's really stressing the importance of, of God's reliability. And he says, that's what makes me a reliable messenger too. I am bringing God's word, not my own. If I trust in God's faithfulness, that this is his word, I won't be giving unclear, changing messages. And he said, I don't take this lightly. I'm not vacillating between two things. I'm not going to say yes then and, and no. Now, this is interesting because this is very popular today. Oftentimes in education, college professors are like this. They seem somewhat indecisive. They don't come to a conclusion. They're not dogmatic because they're trying to be, you know, inclusive of everyone. And they say some see it this way and some see it that way. And the world calls this relativism, which means maybe it's okay for you and not okay for someone else but let's just see both sides of it. And that thinking, of course, has permeated the world, but it's not anything new. In fact, it can creep in to the teaching of God's Word, too. I remember one speaker, he was very gifted in the languages of Hebrew and Greek. He knew many languages, and he understood all of these things. And as he was teaching the Word of God, we were a group of of college-age kids, And he would show all the different views of this passage. And then he'd say, which one is right? And he would say, hard to say. (laughs) And here we were, these young people, and what we wanted to know is that we could trust God's Word. 
Now, it's true, there are some things in God's Word that are hard to be really dogmatic on, but when it comes to the truth of the gospel, it's not a yes and a no. A decision needs to be made. We were talking about Elijah. He had to deal with that same problem with the nation of Israel. He said, how long are you going to falter between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. You need to make a choice. You can't say yes and no. You can't vacillate between two things. You need to choose today who you are going to serve, Joshua said. But, you know, with God's word, it's not a yes and a no. His word is a yes. It's reliable. And so he goes beyond just his own character, and he's really lifting this up to the character of God. Look at verse 19. He says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say maybe. It could be this or it could be that way. He doesn't say yes and no. His purpose is very clear. He says yes. Now look at verse 20. This is our verse for today. He says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. And so as we look at this verse right now, we're going to see three things we learn here about God's promises. The first thing is this. The promises of God are yes. That's what it says. The promise of the gospel message is a positive message. In the gospel, God is saying yes to us. He's not coming us with a no. He has bring, brought us to freedom, not to bondage. That's the message of the gospel. But you say, wait a minute, doesn't the gospel show us that we are sinners? Yes. But that's not the end of the gospel message. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. It's a positive message. When we learn who we are and what Christ has done for us in our condition. So the message of grace is a message that says yes. It's interesting, in contrast, the law had a yes and a no element in it. That picture before you are the two mountains outside the city of Shechem. I was driving by the city in a very bouncy bus, but I snapped this photo because those are really two historic mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And the nation of Israel divided themselves, and half were on one side and half on the other. And some read the blessings, and they were this way, if you do this, you will be blessed. But then on the other side, they read the curses, if you don't do this, you will be cursed. It was a yes and a no. And that was the old covenant, the covenant of the law. But when we come to the new covenant, what do we hear? In Romans 8 and verse 1, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. That's a very positive yes as God's promise. The work of Christ is a yes. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says, John 3, 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's a yes. The Lord said in John 6, 35, He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. If you're looking for satisfaction, it's a yes, not a maybe. And then he says in verse 37, The one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So the Lord Jesus Christ is saying yes to us. He came to give us life. He didn't come to destroy he didn't come to condemn us. He said yes in the wonderful message of the gospel. But you know, sometimes as believers, we forget that. And in our Christian life, it can be easy to turn it into a no. Because sometimes all we hear is, don't do this or don't do that. 
And we can turn the Christian life, this message of freedom, into a law. And it becomes a list of things that we don't do. And how often that is even what the world thinks of Christians. Well, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do this. (laughs) And that mindset can get into us too. But Jesus Christ is God's yes to this world. It's good news. And it says this in Romans 6 and 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And God promises of freedom to us. Now notice this. It's not freedom to do what I want to do. I am now free to do what He wants me to do. That's part of this wonderful promise. And not to be under a burden, not to be fearful. Because if I'm trying to do something, and someone is watching me try to do it, it's easy for me to make a mistake. Oh, you didn't do that right. Oh, you screwed up there. (laughs) Some of you might know that I'm a painter. I go outside and I paint pictures on location in God's creation. And I was up at Storybook Lodge Christian Camp, this past summer. And after the message, I said, after dinner, I'm going to go down to the lake and I'm going to paint a picture by the lake. So all the kids came down to watch. And I did it for about three hours and they watched every brush stroke I made. But I had one guy on the side who kept saying, well, that tree doesn't look right. (laughs) I don't think that's the right color. And I can guarantee you, if you live under that kind of pressure, you'll never do something that's good and right. I guarantee that. And so the promises of God are yes. But number two is very important. Listen carefully. The promises in God are yes only because of Jesus Christ. Only because of Him. The only reason God can say yes to you today is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the most important words to me in that verse are those two words, in Him. In who? In Jesus Christ. The promises of God in Him. And the wonderful truth is that when you and I are saved, the Bible tells us we are placed in Christ. We are in Him. And it's because of that that God can say yes to us. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All of these things we would never have on our own and never could we earn them or do them, but the Lord Jesus Christ did, and when we trust on him, we are in him. And so the promises of God are, yes, only because of Jesus Christ. So make sure we all understand that. Because without the Lord Jesus, God can only say no to a sinner. Isn't that what the law was all about too? Think of the 600 or so laws in the Old Testament law. You probably know the Ten Commandments the best. What phrase is in aid of those Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not. (laughs) It was all a no, wasn't it? And thou shalt not is said 144 times in the first five books of the Bible. And so all the benefits we receive by grace are only because of Him. There's no forgiveness of sin. There's no eternal life. There's no divine love and the mercy of God without Him, Jesus Christ. And the reason we know is because God is holy and He can't tolerate our sin. Our sin has separated us from a holy God, and therefore He has to say no to us. And so those words in Him are really what's important here for us today. And notice in those two verses I read, He said this three times. In verse 19, He says, but in Him was yes. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. And only because of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ can God promise all these blessings to us. So again, let me be perfectly clear about this. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, 
God must say no to you. You must be in Him, not by doing something, but by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the promises of God are yes. The promises of God are yes only because of Jesus Christ. But then the third one, the promises of God are certain. They are guaranteed. He's even going to talk about the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee for us as believers. That means these promises will happen. They are certain. And so just enjoy this verse with me again. Verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him are men, to the glory of God through us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. But you know what? We might never have had this precious verse if Paul had not been so ill-treated by these men of Corinth. <laughs> Think of why he was doing this. He was defending his ministry and his character, but to really make it clear, he gave us this wonderful truth about God's promises. Many years ago, the preacher John Wesley, who kept very good journals, was writing on a Sunday in June. It's, it's titled June 4th. And he read those verses we read in 1 Peter, as his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, exceedingly great and precious promises. And here's what he says. He says, all these days I scarce remember to have opened the New Testament, but upon some great and precious promise. And I saw more than ever that the gospel is in truth, but one great promise from the beginning to the end. <laughs> It's exceedingly great. They're precious. There is no limit. It seems wherever you look, there's a promise. Herbert Lockyer has written, I think, the definitive book on the promises of God. It's called All the Promises of God. And he has found 8,800 promises in the Bible. We've looked at about three this weekend. <laughs> and there's probably even more than he said. And all of those promises, all of them, are yes in Him. And they're certain because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been reflecting a lot back on my time in Sunday school, where we learn a lot of things. One of the songs that we often would sing was, Every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. It's a nice-sounding song, but it's not completely true. Because not every promise is for us. And so I did want to mention in our messages the importance that we understand the promises correctly and don't misunderstand them. There's a number of reasons why we misunderstand them. One of the biggest reasons is just the context of the Scripture. Because some promises are written to a specific individual for that person. Other promises are written to a specific nation. And so I can't walk over Israel today and, and plow out a piece of ground and say, this is mine because of God's promise. <laughs> and you know, and part of that issue of misunderstanding the context, if you watch a lot of preachers on TV, you're going to hear people talk about claiming the promises of being healthy and wealthy. That's not what we're talking about. Those promises were largely for the nation of Israel. So who is this promise for? But notice this. We can say that every promise that God has made is certain because of the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter who it's for. But every promise that He ever made to me is certain because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can lay hold of that promise as mine because the Lord Jesus Christ died for me, and He died for you. So it's really all because of the cross. That's what I wanted you to see. All those Old Testament promises, everything is coming together in the work on the cross. So think of the promises you have as a believer. The promises of the forgiveness of sin, of your salvation, of heaven, of eternal life. Fellowship with God and with each other and the Lord Jesus Christ. Guidance from God, His presence, answered prayer, 
And as many as are the promises of God, they are all yes in Jesus Christ. If you know this, and if you believe this, your life is going to be different. And you won't be like that guy who is crawling across the ice in fear, wonder if it's going to crack. You know, these promises are not just words. They are facts because of the truth of God's Word and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of us can say when we read the promises, Jesus Christ has said it, therefore it is true. (laughs) That's what Paul goes on to say at the end of the verse. Did you see how it ended? He said, the promises in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. Going back to Sunday school again, we were taught to say amen at the end of our prayers. I had no idea what it meant, but it just sounded good, and everybody said it together. And sometimes we say it means, so be it. It has the same idea of, that's true. (laughs) That's what we're saying. Amen. These are true. Now, what's interesting in the Scripture, one of the titles given to the Lord Jesus is the Amen. In the book of Revelation, he says to the church at Laodicea, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So Jesus Christ is the Amen. He's the one who's saying this is true. He's the fulfillment of the promises. He's the verifier of the promises. And he can say, amen, that's true. But you know what? We're in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we too can say, amen. We can say that's true because of him. God has said it. He's saying yes to us. We say, God, you said this. And God said, yes, I did say that. Therefore, it's true. Amen. That promise is mine. Now, let me try to explain that a little clearer. Charles Spurgeon had a great way of illustrating things. He wrote a book about a lot of promises, too. Herbert Lockyer's book is just a a list of many promises, as is Charles Spurgeon's. It was called Faith Checkbook. He says this. Let's say someone gives you a check, and your name is written on that check and there's a date on it. And your name is there, and that check is a promise. Isn't that what a check is? It's a promise to you. It's a yes. Why? Because it's been signed. The person who gave it to you wrote their name on it. But let me tell you what I often do. Someone will give me a check, and I'll put it in my wallet, and it'll stay there for a month. (laughs) I forget about it. That check is doing me no good right then, is it? (laughs) Because that check is to represent money to me. (laughs) So how do I get that money? I have to take that check, turn it over, and endorse it and write my name on the check. And when you write your name on the back of that check, do you know what you're saying? You're saying amen. (laughs) This is for me. This is mine. You believe that's what written on the other side of the check is payable to you. So when I endorse the promise of God, then I receive this wonderful benefit. And that's how it works with God. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, we can say amen. God said it in his word. I believe it. He's going to keep that promise. So why do we get promises? Well, they're great, they're beneficial, they're happy, they're encouraging, they give us all the blessings we want in life. That's true. But what does God say at the end of this verse? Paul tells us this, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God. Yes, they give us great benefits, but ultimately, These are unto the glory of God, so God can get the glory. Why does he promise you these things? So he would be glorified. So we can boast in God and say, look what he has given to us. God is reliable. He won't let us down. And so we stand by faith, 
we often say we stand on the promises of God. Not like that man on the ice. What was he doing? He was crawling across the ice in fear. We can stand on what God has said and believe it. And that's going to affect how you live. And God's goal is that others would notice that in you and ultimately glorify God because of what he has done. Not because what we did, but just because we believe God's promises and he works and changes us. And that's what it means to glorify God, just to make God look good through our lives. All the promises of God in him. Notice those last two lines, though, the last two words, to the glory of God through us. Through us is this glory shown to God. Well, that seems a little odd. Doesn't the Bible say that the heavens declare the glory of God? The stars? Us? How are we the ones who glorify God? He is using you and I to display the glory of God. That's what he has chosen to do. And we honor God by trusting him, by believing what he has said, by standing on the promises of God and not be like that man on the ice who wasn't standing but was just creeping along in fear, not being secure. And then Paul, at the end of the chapter, look at verse 24, he concludes with his goal, his purpose. He says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. The word dominion there is the idea of lording it over as a boss. We're not here as your spiritual bosses saying you have to do this or else. He says, we are fellow workers. We are right alongside of you for one reason, for your joy. (laughs) We're doing that for your joy. And so he says, fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. So there's a wonderful connection here between standing, having strength, and joy by simply having faith in the promises of God. Joy. But we often struggle with joy. Our brother Randy talked about having joy last night. Why aren't we joyful? Apparently, according to this verse, it's because we forget the promises of God. One year ago, I was at Believer's Bible Conference down in Dallas. And I was about halfway through the conference, and I got a call that my father had fallen down the stairs. He's 94, lives alone at home. He tried to call someone, but it it didn't work out. But somehow they got, they understood he was trying to call somebody, and somehow the police ended up in his home. And so I went home from the conference, and my dad was in a very serious stage. He's 94, life was hard but his neck was broken in four places. It was so hard. And finally, it was time to say, well, we're not sure that he can breathe on his own. And in just a few minutes, I literally watched as the life went away from my dad. And I left that hospital, and I was filled with joy. You know why? This is the best thing for him. It's the best thing for all of us. When he is at that age, it was going to be hard. And that pursued my delight in the Lord. But you know, the months went by and I got depressed. I got sad. You know why? I forgot the promises of God. We have eternal life. We're going to see Him again. When we remember the promises of God, it brings us joy. It brings us strength. What a wonderful thing. So Paul is telling us that truth. And his promise is that he would finish this work in you. You know, oftentimes, though, when, when we look at ourselves, we see our weaknesses, we see our faults, and we see our sin. And if you don't see them in yourself, we often see them in others. <laughs> but you know, when we see what God sees, do you know what he sees in us? 
There's a lovely old song. It says, God sees my Savior, and then he sees me in the beloved, accepted, and free. (laughs) He sees us in Jesus Christ. We see our flaws. He sees us in what we are going to become. He sees who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says this in Philippians 1, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I've been showing you that the will of God is his word. It's his promise. He will complete this work in all of us. When? At the day of Jesus Christ. When's that? When all of us here who know the Lord Jesus are gathered together up in heaven. I don't know how it's going to work, but we're all going to be there together. Trophies of his grace. Praising him. His work will be complete. I think that's what John Darby had in mind when he wrote that hymn we love to sing. And is it so I shall be like thy son? Listen to the last verse. Listen how much it sounds like what we've been saying today. He says, Nor I alone, thy loved ones all complete, in glory round thee there with joy shall meet, all like thee, for thy glory like thee, Lord, object supreme of all, by all, I, by all adored. All like thee, all like Christ, for his glory, because of what he's done. And so we pray these promises and we say, As we read the words of David, do as thou hast said. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God for us. So we've seen how David prayed the promises of God. Elijah prayed the promises of God. Mary prayed the promises of God. Be it unto me, Lord, as you have said, according to your word. Paul prayed the promises of God. But what about today? Can we still do that? Can we still have that same confidence? Let me close with a quick story. In our little chapel, we just have 12 people there in Minnesota. But we're always there on Wednesday nights. We're faithful about it. And there's a number of missionaries that we've gotten to know over the years. And there's a family in Korea. They're in the city of Seoul. And um, we've been praying for them a long time. But the missionary said his son, even though he's heard the gospel all his life, has never been saved. It's been many years, and he's hardened to the gospel. We have one brother in our meeting who began to pray every Wednesday for this man. And he prayed the promise of God. You know what the promise of God is from Peter? 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack. He's not weak concerning his promise. He is not willing that any should perish. Lord, you don't want this one to perish. (laughs) Will you save him? This brother in our meeting prayed for 15 years. (laughs) Honestly, we got a little tired of it. That's not going to happen. On December 15th, we got a letter from the missionary He said, Samuel, our son, has given us much encouragement in the Lord. Many have prayed for many years that he would turn to the Lord. About three months ago, he made a complete turn to the Lord and is devouring his word daily with a complete change in heart and behavior. And then after the new year, we got another letter just on January 11th of this year. He said, Samuel, our son, turned 48. He's not a young kid. He said, we celebrated with a meal at our home. Good news, Sam has made a complete turn to the Lord and is devouring the Bible daily, even though he is very busy doing several jobs. This is my favorite part. This morning, he was reading the Bible and missed his subway stop. (laughs) Sunday, he comes to the assembly, and his whole attitude and life has changed. Thank you for your prayers for him. Pray for his growth and grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. What do you think the brother in our meeting is praying for now every Wednesday? That he would grow. And this brother's in the Word. I love it that he takes his, you know, there's 10 million people in Seoul. He's taking the subway home and he forgets to get off at his stop because he's enjoying the Word of God. Can God change lives? Are God's promises true? Are they yes and amen? They are in Christ. And so you can pray those promises too. For those dear ones of you, that, of yours that don't know the Lord, pray for them. The Lord loves to save. Let's pray.
Our God and Father, we thank you for this marvelous message. This wonderful truth, Lord, it's such a wonderful plan that you're laying out throughout the whole Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, your plan has been coming to light. It's been revealed to us and these wonderful promises made to Israel that you are going to keep. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you now that we understand they're all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So, Lord, help us to trust your promises and just believe you what you have said in your word because they are yes and in him, amen. We thank you for everyone here. We pray your blessing upon this time as we depart in Jesus' name, amen.